Hi, hello everyone. I'm Priya from First Indiana Robotics and I'm one of the student board members. And today we have Brian Rushton from LHP and he's going to be talking a little bit about what kind of work they do at LHP Data Analytics and what kind of problems they solve. And I'll let him introduce himself now. Yep, awesome. Well, thank you, Priya. So happy to be here. Um, as Priya mentioned, I work for a company called LHP. Uh, its full name is LHP Engineering Solutions. Um, I work for the data analytics and IoT team uh, within that, but our company started in 2001 uh, working on uh, embedded automotive engine controls. So uh, to put that into a little bit simpler phrase, we helped the uh, engine controls for Cummins uh, diesel engines. So we're based out of here in uh, Columbus, Indiana. That's where Cummins is at. Um, since then, since 2001, we've grown to uh, nearly 500 employees um, all around the world. We work with uh, virtually every major automotive um, manufacturer and a lot of the, the tier one suppliers uh, with them, still doing a lot of those embedded controls. Um, and I, I always kind of give the example of, uh, you know, chances are the car you, you know, may have driven or may be sitting in your driveway now that we're all not traveling as much. Uh, probably has an LHP engineer, you know, kind of thumbprint on it somewhere. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, if it happens to not be one of the vehicles uh, next to it, almost surely do. So, um, so we've grown to 500 different people all over the world. Um, my team is the data analytics and IoT solutions business. So we started that about four years ago um, and it's starting to grow uh, exponentially at this point. So what the owner of LHP kind of realized is, you know, look, we've got these electronics controls. They have all kinds of data and information coming off of them. Uh, we need to be able to take that information and turn it into insight and provide that um, value to our customers and have that capability. So we started in 2016, um, where we're growing quite a bit. Um, and it's it's been pretty crazy. It's almost kind of like we're a startup within uh, a larger business. So it's interesting that way. Uh, definitely. Um, can you you kind of covered it? But what type of problems do do LHP engineers solve? So yeah, so it's it's you know the the automotive engine controls is certainly kind of the the hallmark and and what we've done historically, but. You know, if you come to our innovation lab in Columbus, I always um, kind of laugh and say, well, you know, if you went back into our storage room, there's a hospital bed. You know, people kind of look at you, you know, well, why is there a hospital bed? Well, you know, if you've been around a hospital bed um, for whatever reason, there's a lot of controls that they have, right? Uh, so we've helped um, do those, those types of controls. Uh, it, it's kind of the same concepts, some of the same coding languages and same protocols and then things like that. Um, our group, um, the data analytics team, you know, data is everywhere, right? It, it's completely um, infiltrated just about everything. So, you know, we've worked with healthcare, finance, uh, manufacturing, um, just, you know, pretty much every industry out there um, because data is everywhere, right? So. <laughs> yeah. So with like data being everywhere, what are the kind of um, technical employees that you hire? So is it like mainly programmers or? So that's, a, that's a great question. So um, it, it depends a lot more than you would think. So our team, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of coding and development, um, but a lot of the other areas of LHP are, are doing other things. So we have a, a division that is fully dedicated purely to hardware. Uh, so we have some mechanical engineers. Uh, we have a lot of electrical engineers, as you might imagine. Um, computer science, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, I always laugh because some of our best developers on our team don't actually have that background at all. One of them is an aerospace engineer and the other one is has a, a civil engineering degree. Um, but again, these disciplines are all kind of starting to uh, need to know some very similar um, things, you know, around coding and how data works. These, these industries and these disciplines are being driven by data. So they've become very good at the type of work that we need, which is that that coding capability. Um, and then likewise, we actually have a couple people. They work on, um, you know, web web pages and things like that. So kind of front end and, and user interface type things. 
um, they don't actually have a, a college degree. Uh, they came straight out of high school and, you know, went through a, a certification program and now they've, they've joined us working on that. So uh, a lot of flexibility, a lot of um, people from all kinds of walks of life working with us. So specifically at your location, what are the types of other positions that you hire for there other than like the technical people? Right. So there's going to be people like me. So I, I myself actually don't have a, a traditional uh, technology background. So I have more of a business background. Um, so I, I work as what's called business development manager. Um, so I, I go out and what I do is I actually translate the needs of, you know, okay, what you know, what do the engineers need? What do the business people need um, from our technical team? So, you know, if, if you've spent much time around them, and I, I think, you know, first, Indiana Robotics can, can probably show this very quickly. Those are two different types of actions, right? So I spend a lot of my time trying to translate, you know, okay, well, what he's asking for is this, and what you need to provide him is more, you know, this, right? Him or her, right? So, um, I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, we certainly have, you know, all the normal support staff of, of business, HR, you know, finance, accounting, um, and then managers and leaders, right? So we have a lot of people who, you know, if we have five or 10 people on a client site, um, you know, if you come to our offices, sometimes our offices are very empty because everybody's out at a client site. Um, we need people who have the capability to manage and, and lead others at those client sites without a lot of supervision from, um, you know, kind of from the home office. So those are some of the, the other roles you'll see. Yeah. Um, so what kinds of traits would you look for in those employees that need to be able to work offsite? Right. So that's, that's a great question. And, and I always give what I, I think is kind of a surprising answer. People always seem a little bit surprised by it. Um, of course, I do need people who who have technical competencies, right? I need them to be able to code. I need them to be able to, um, you know, kind of creatively uh, apply technology to solve an issue. Um, but I also need them to have uh, pretty good soft skills, right? So I, I need them to be able to kind of do the more traditional things, um, like show up on time and, and dress appropriately and, and have really good communication skills. Um, because, you know, otherwise it's, it's really hard to provide value in, in that customer environment. So the soft skills are, are critical, um, essential even. So. Oh, definitely. So do you offer like internships for high school or college students and how can they apply for those? Yeah. So um, one of the ways, so we kind of have to take it on a year by year basis. Um, obviously this year might look a little bit different than, than maybe in years past. We do try to have um, some internship programs, both at the college level and uh, you know, even maybe more of a local high school level. Um, can those can be kind of on a case by case basis because what we don't want to do is, you know, have a, a student or somebody dedicate their summer to us. Um, and then we don't either have the bandwidth or, you know, kind of interesting work that, that really makes it worth their while to do. Um, so the, the best way to kind of sort that out would be um, to reach out to me, um, you know, and I can put you in contact with the right areas of our company uh, to kind of talk through that and, and see how we can support it. So one of the projects that we have had um, before, we've had a, a team of seven or eight, and this wasn't strictly our data analytics division. Uh, they were working something on something called the TOAD project. Um, and that's an acronym that stands for um, to Towable Autonomous Drayage uh, and gross oversimplification. But basically what it is, is it's an automated vehicle that you would, you know, electronically, not physically, hook to your vehicle and it would follow you. So if you have a very small compact car, you need to transfer a whole bunch of wood or lumber or whatever it is home, you would basically put a sensor on your car and it would follow you. Um, and so we actually had some interns working on that as a project up in Indianapolis um, for the last couple of years. So just in general, do you have like any advice for first students to apply for their first jobs or kind of like how they should go about getting, um, figure out their career path? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So from what I know about first is, um, in, in most interview cases, I would lead with that, that, that you were part of, 
you know, the first Indiana robotics, you participated on a team um, because number one, a lot of times, you know, it's extracurricular. It's something you volunteered to do. Um, number two, it's, it's team-based, you know, you, you've had to learn how to work within a team, kind of what your strengths and skills are within that team and, and how to uh, come together um, with people who may have different skills and, and try to achieve the goal. Right. So I, I would, you know, always lead with that um, almost both on my resume and even in the interview. Um, Cause that absolutely is going to make you stand out. Um, it's, it's invaluable experience over someone who, you know, maybe just kind of went through a traditional schooling experience and, you know, doesn't have a, a, a lot of other experience. We always get a lot of people who say, um, well, you know, I, I don't have much experience and I you know, always try to ask them, okay, well, what are some of the things you, you like to do? Well, you know, maybe I was on, you know, a, a sports team or, um, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know, I, I babysat all the way through high school, whatever it is. And I said, okay, well, let's step back. You know, if you babysat, that was a lot of responsibility. If you were on a team, that was a lot of responsibility. You showed up, you contributed, um, you know, you had teammates that were depending on you and you fulfilled your, your obligation for that. So that's, that's a huge thing. Um, you know, and again, kind of everybody who's involved in first Indiana robotics, um, mention that, right. I mean, that's awesome. I would love to hear that. Um, because I, I have our, our team, you know, I mentioned we were kind of a startup. Um, when I joined, there were six of us. Now there's about 30 of us. I've had to help hire those other, other um, people. So I've sat in hundreds of interviews and um, I can tell you that would, that would jump right off the page or, or right through the conversation if somebody mentioned that experience. Yeah, absolutely. So what about like, so can you tell us a little bit about how your career path like what your journey was? Cause you said that yeah. you didn't have the traditional experience of a program. Absolutely. So um, I, you know, I, I went to, um, you know, through my local high school and everything had, had relatively good grades. Um, and then when I actually started college, I actually started in an electrical engineering um, pathway, didn't know really what I wanted to do, what the opportunities were. Um, so I actually ended up switching to business again, not because it wasn't, I, I didn't like electrical engineering. I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I just had switched into that and thought, well, okay, I mean, this will work. Right. Um, so I, I went through school, was able to, to work through school, um, which, you know, again, kind of gave me a lot of experience. I always see if somebody on the resume, if they held a part-time job or, or whatever while they were in school, um, you know, that always, you know, kind of impresses me because I understand what it's like to have to have that time management and that balance. Um, then when I graduated school I'm in Columbus, Indiana, so I did what a lot of other people did in this area. Um, I started working for Cummins, uh, the diesel engine manufacturer um, down in this area. And there, that was when I, I got hooked up. I started in what was called the, the marketing business intelligence area. Um, and what that was doing was doing all of the, the sales and, and, and reporting for the, um, the parts business. So, you know, you sell an engine and then throughout that engine's life, it's going to need parts um, to need maintained and to keep running. Um, I helped with all of the reporting with that. Um, you know, we, we did, you know, 40 some reports um, every year for sales of $2.5 billion. So it was a lot of stuff. Um, but that was all very technical in nature. So I had a business background. I understood, okay, these are how the part sales are flowing. These are, you know, kind of what the, the profit margins are, things like that. Um, and then the people I worked with had very heavy um, computer science backgrounds. So I kind of just learned through being very, very close with them. Um, and, you know, I, I always had a, an interest and in, in a little bit of an aptitude in, you know, with computers and sort of mechanical things as well. Um, I grew up racing motorcycles, so certainly I understood some of the mechanical aspects. Um, I was in some different school classes that they offered that were very heavy in, in computer science and in some of those concepts. There certainly weren't as many options as there are now um, for, for students to take. So I always say that I would have really enjoyed going to school now when there's all these other options. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my path. I just, I learned by working 
uh, with those people for a lot of years to a point now where really I've, I've made a career out of it. Um, I worked for Cummins for eight years. Uh, LHP started. Several of the guys I worked with left to go to LHP because we'd been able to do some really cool things at Cummins. Um, and then they asked me if I would want to join them. Um, so that was a, kind of a, a nice honor that they would ask me because they knew me. They knew exactly what I was and wasn't capable of. So um, they had asked me to, to join them then. So that's a little bit about my path. Absolutely. That's really interesting. So is there a time that you can mention where you and your team faced like some sort of challenge and you had to overcome to solve it? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, maybe what we're going through right now might be, you know, kind of a, a good example. So certainly while we record this, we're in the midst of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. We've all been working from home. Um, you know, I, I have a, my daughter's running up and down the hallway right now. This isn't actually where I'm at, of course. It's just what's behind me is not really pretty. So I put up another, another background. Um, but we, you know, as everything shut down, we had a lot of our auto manufacturers stop producing. And so they sent a lot of our people home. Um, so our contracts are, are all very, uh, in jeopardy right now right so that's kind of scary for us not knowing you know how are we going to continue to keep everybody on and, and keep everybody paid and employed so what we kind of did um you know we're, we're still managing through all that and and everything but we've thought okay well what are our skill sets um well we we know sensors pretty well we know analytics pretty well we have a lot of different contacts we work with a lot of different manufacturers what are some of the things that they're going to need once this pandemic is over and or you know starts to we start to have some of the restrictions eased right so um over the last few weeks you know remotely while we're all at home we've been trying to come up with what we're calling a connected workplace uh health analytics platform um, and basically what it is, is it takes a lot of the knowledge that we already have, but it just applies it in, in a little bit different of a way. Um, you know, you think about a lot of these manufacturers, they have a lot of people coming into very close proximity to one another. So we're developing a system that allows them to kind of track some different metrics, whether that's their temperature or, or whatever. And then we're also putting, um, these very inexpensive, very low powered sensors. Um, you know, we're, we're getting those. And the employees and the team members will carry those with them around the facility. Um, it doesn't tell us exactly where they are down to the foot, but what it does do is tell us approximately where they are in, in the plant or the facility. Um, that way, if, if, you know, unfortunately somebody does come down with uh, an illness, um, we can then go back and go, okay, well, um, all of these people never had any interaction with that person, uh, but we can see that um, this person interacted with these other people. So then we can kind of take more proactive action um, and more localized action rather than, you know, having to shut a, a whole plant down, which just has, you know, a, a huge impact both on people's lives and, and, you know, finances and all that other stuff. So that's kind of something that I think is a good example of what our team's been able to do is, is pivot and go, okay, we're not doing uh, what we were. What are some things we can do that not only, fit our skill sets, but might also be able to help. Absolutely. And so my last question for you will be, what has been like your favorite milestone or moment of your job when you're like, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be? <laughs> um, that, that's interesting. I, I, don't, I don't know if I just have one. Um, I, I think one of the interesting things, so we're, we're in uh, Columbus, Indiana. I went to schools, very rural school in, in Brown County, Indiana. And not long after I got this job, um, I was actually able to go back to my old elementary school, um, which again is in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's very, very rural. Um, but I was able to go back and, and kind of talk with, with some of those kids uh, about, you know, kind of what we're doing today, what I, you know, what I do for a living and, and get to do. And it kind of hit me that, wow, you know, I, I think when I was growing up, I took for granted that I thought I was going to have to leave, um, you know, the area to go do something cool. I was going to have to go to, you know, one of the coasts or, or whatever, but 
I was just absolutely sure that nothing cool was happening here, right? Um, and kind of the message that I was able to trans, you know, give to the kids, and, and hopefully it it kind of hit home is that no, actually, what's happening here where you live and and work, it, you know, it's you're competing on the global marketplace right from here. Um, you know, you can do that. You don't have to leave. It's happening here. Um, so I think that experience was kind of a, a cool indication, um, you know, that, hey, I, I get to do some pretty cool stuff right in the area where, where I grew up. So I, th I think that was a neat experience. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any last comments or stories you'd like to share? Uh, you know, I, I think I just really want to encourage anybody that's, that's listening to this to, uh, you know, stay participating in, in things exactly like um, FIRST. I mean, it's a fantastic program, um, again, that I think will give you a leg up, not only in your personal development, but also, um, you know, in your career as you go forward. So um, great job and, and keep it up. This is a, a terrific opportunity you have. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us today on the stream. We really appreciate having you here and talking about your job. Absolutely, thank you. So right now we're gonna transition into another interview with Ms. Lisa Deck, and she's from INMAC, a program that has been supporting First Teams for the last couple of years, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa Deck. I'm the program manager at INMAC, which is the Indiana Manufacturing um, competitiveness center. We are based out of Purdue University, um, but basically, you know, our role is to provide programs um, to organizations that implement manufacturing initiatives, specifically in the K-12 education, uh, post-secondary students, and also uh, incumbent workforce. Uh, the microgrant program came about uh, when uh, our team kind of started talking about how could we take a small amount of money to make a large impact? Um, so in 2018, we launched the first round of micro grants and it has really um, evolved into something pretty special. Uh, it's given, uh, you know, students, educators, organizations, industry opportunities to use that seed money to grow programs, to start new programs, um, to really connect partnerships as well. So um, we've had several first Indiana robotics teams that have applied for our micro grant. Uh, the grant can be up to $2,000. So with that $2,000, some of the examples of the first robotics teams that have applied um, have utilized those to basically take their, their knowledge and their skills of their team concept and using those professional skills and doing camps for youth, um, taking those dollars to help purchase equipment to uh, enhance the robots and to help students with maybe a, a new set of curriculum, if you will, to, you know, to make new things. So, um, so that's a little bit about the micro grant program. Uh, NMAC as a whole, uh, on the education workforce side, which is uh, Sasha Harrell and myself, you know, we also um, have programs called the Design and Innovation Studios, where we have uh, studios put in elementary schools and industry uh, to build awareness around manufacturing competencies and jobs, or careers, um, and things like that. We also do internship programs um, and uh, several other little things, but those are some of our big things. Yeah, definitely. So can you tell me a little bit more about like the three tenets of like the INMAC mission? Sure. Um, you know, our goal, like I said, is really to uh, raise awareness and to uh, build out an ecosystem that by taking some of the programs that, that we have in place and, and building on that. Um, one of the, the perspective pieces that I'm working on right now is in, in particular with the micro grant program is that how that we've been able to network and connect with so many industry partners and educators that have given us an opportunity to build out additional uh, programs or projects with them. So for example, you know, uh, I'm working on a pathway system in, in Southern Indiana right now with a large um, automotive manufacturer. Out of that pathway, 
um, so many things have just really uh, blossomed, if you will, uh, to to per, to help those students not only in in that county but um, in the region as a whole. So that's really you know those are some of the real key pillars of what we're trying to accomplish is to be able to take projects and programs and grow them into something else. Which again, the, the micro grant program is, you know, it is a small amount of money. I mean, yes, $2,000 isn't something, you know, too little per se, but with $2,000, we're impacting, um, you know, just in, in 2019 and 20, we've had 79 applicants. Um, we've impacted over uh, 56 counties in all 12 economic regions, you know, the, just like the mapping behind me here with the economic regions. Uh, and it's impacted over uh, over 50,000 students and adults alike. And that's what we're all about, is to help uh, leverage that ecosystem and to grow out opportunities to help build awareness around what really happens underneath a manufacturing um, organization's roof. Yeah, absolutely. So since you mentioned that you're the program manager, um, of this grant. Um, how did your career path kind of lead you to be in this position? Well, that's, that's a, it's a really interesting story, Priya. Um, so I, when I graduated from high school several years ago, um, I actually had the opportunity to pay, uh, play um, basketball collegiately, and I'll never forget it because I went, and this is pr prior to Facebook, cell phones, FaceTime, uh, all of that, and um, I, I went and off to college, and I remember going to a payphone and, and calling my mom because I was so incredibly homesick for my parents, um, and, you know, she, I called her, and, and she says, we'll, we'll be up to, to get you, we'll, we'll come talk to you, and I, I said that, you know, she should have said, suck it up, um, and, and we'll talk to you at Christmas, uh, but long story short, everything happens for a reason. Um, and I, you know, came back home. Um, I married my high school sweetheart and, um, you know, we started our life very early. I got a phone call one day. I, I was actually in between jobs at the time and, and we had a one-year-old and get a phone call from a high school friend that said, Hey, our local manufacturing organization, um, it's called Valio. Um, is looking for a part of somebody to cover a maternity leave um, in the uh, quality department. And then so she said, I really, you know, would like for you to help me out if you can, you know, be good, you know, good for you. And, and so we said, sure, let me get some things figured out. And long story short, um, you know, I stayed at Valio. It ended up turning into a full-time opportunity. Um, I stayed there 13 years and uh, had five different opportunities to work in different departments. And that's where my passion really started to grow in the aspect of prior to getting that phone call, I had no clue um, what happened uh, with, within manufacturing. Um, so I, I finished my bachelor's degree. They paid for that. I went back, got my master's degree, and they paid for that. Um, and so it really... Um, just the experience of being a part of a manufacturing team, if you will, really is what led my career path. I always said I never really chose my career path. It, it was chosen for me, but that's okay because I think that's what happens with a lot of students. Uh, young adults is, uh, you know, we go to college and I work for Purdue University. So, you know, I'm all about four-year um, educations and being able to take those and, and have a, you know, really successful career. But I'm also about um, learning things with hands-on experience, uh, kind of what I always call being in the trenches and being able to look and expand yourself and really put yourself in a, in a situation that you really weren't anticipating and how do you react to that. So, so since then, I mean, I um, obviously I've always had manufacturing uh, in, in, Pretty much every job description I've ever had, uh, but I did go into post-secondary education, really focusing on learning more about that, and uh, it's kind of led me to this this opportunity of building out career pathways and setting up programs such as the micro grant program that I'm very passionate about to help students. So, in your position right now, what can you tell us? 
like what a day in a life of a program manager is like. So what are like your tasks and duties and how they kind of change now during work from home? Yeah, so um, so I obviously, I live in Greensburg, Indiana, so very close to, to Brian and, and Columbus. Um, so I have, since I've been with Purdue, uh, which is a two years now, uh, I have worked from home per se, but I always said that if I'm sitting at my home office, I'm not making a difference to some degree. So I really liked being out and, and working with the schools and working with industry partners and actually traveling and, and setting up and facilitating um, conversations around manufacturing. Uh, and so what's changed for me uh, a lot through the, the, this COVID process um, is that I am just doing a whole lot of Zoom calls, WebExes, different uh, platforms, if you will, and, and pretty much having uh, interviews kind of like I'm having with you right now is just all turned into, you know, sitting here in my home office and, and, and making things happen. So I still really want to find our new normal and be able to get back out and get our schools back opened back up and uh, be able to get back in those industries and start, you know, developing partnerships. But I think for now, you know, I'm going to continue to uh, basically uh, do what we're doing and, and, and connecting people virtually. Yeah, absolutely. So for teams that haven't utilized the grant before, how uh, complicated is the application for the grant or are like there specific things that you're looking for in the application? Yeah, so our next round of uh, micro grants will be released this fall. Um, and what we look for is um, we look for new and innovative uh, initiatives uh, that people are just like I said, looking for a little seed money to get them started. So, you know, anything creative or innovative that's going to help impact, a, you know, as many people as possible. Um, that's what that's what we're looking for. We're also looking, you know, you know, for with the robotics teams, uh, we've had several that applied the, you know, two years in a row. Um, but we've always asked of them to please do something a little different. Um, each time so that we know that you're looking at something very sustainable. The ultimate goal of these micro grants is truly to um, blossom or grow programs into something much bigger than what the initial uh, thought was. So that's what we're looking for, that creativity, innovation, continuous improvement, um, and being able to really share with youth and adults alike of what manufacturing careers look like or can look like. So can you, and you kind of touched on it there, but what is like your vision for where InMac is going to take like um, students in Indiana in the next five or 10 years? Like what do you want to see? Yeah, so our goal at InMac is again to just help build that, um, you know, the perceptions of, of manufacturing and to help really educate and give give students an opportunity to really think more creatively about what their post-secondary options look like. Um, we, you know, again, we're all about the uh, internships and the hands-on experiences and providing access to manufacturers. Um, but we also know that digital technology is here to stay, obviously, and it's only, only going to become um, more um, intrusive of, of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And so our goal is to continue to educate and to share and to prep and have students and adults that are ready for the five years down the road because there's jobs out there that are going to happen that don't even exist today. So being able to stay on top of what that looks like uh, and being able to look at, you know, what can we do to help build that awareness or to uh, uh, really share the knowledge to make it accessible is our goal. Yeah, and that's like amazing what you guys have been able to do. But um, just one last question, I guess, since you work with so many schools and like you get to see the students, um, what inspires you? Like what inspires you to do all of this for the educators? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really what gets me out of bed in the morning, to be honest. I mean, it's, 
there's nothing, um, you, there's something new all the time that is, uh, is happening. And to be in a position to help, help guide those uh, teachers or educators or, you know, some of the post-secondary curriculum or even work directly with a, a manufacturing company that is uh, just needing to grow their workforce development. Um, that just drives me. I, I've always had a passion for people. Um, I've always had a passion to help people grow into something more than they ever thought they could be. So that's, you know, that's what we do. And, and Sasha and I both, I mean, we just have a passion for education and workforce. So we just, you know, we just take that passion and continue to grow um, the, the perceptions and, and really try to just help as many people as possible. My ultimate goal is for, you know, if I, if I had a magic wand, it would be to be able to build out these programs and have opportunities for students that would never have to borrow another dime to go to, to college. I mean, that would be the ultimate goal for me. I mean, that's something I'm extremely passionate about is to find those opportunities to partner with industry and to partner with businesses to help students um, just grow and, and not be debt, you know, in so much debt. Yeah, and I like I have to say like my team was a recipient of your grant. I know a lot of my friends' teams are a recipient of that grant. It's just really amazing, and we are so grateful. And thank you so much for your support uh, for seeing you in our Hey, no problem. Yeah. No, but it's our pleasure, and and we um, we are really you know always interested in the first Indiana Robotics um, organization, what they do, their passion. Um, and what, what it really does for the students. I mean, we have met, uh, such as yourself, Priya, we've just met some incredibly intelligent young uh, adults, uh, young, you know, I call them young adults because they're, you know, they're really doing some great things out there. And to watch them be innovative and creative is, is just, it just makes our job so much easier in the big picture.